At the New School, we believe creativity isn't a concept. It's a calling. It's what drives you out into the world to make the things that make a difference. At our schools, we teach creative problem solving by dissolving walls between academic disciplines so you can rigorously rethink everything. Together, we draw inspiration from human insight. We purposefully collaborate, try things over and over, and become invaluable to a world that doesn't exist yet. It's why our university is filled with journalists designing new media, playwrights creating tools for social good, designers collaborating with ethnographers and anthropologists, economists examining human interactions, musicians and media artists composing with light and space. Creativity in the right hands changes everything. Because it's not what you know, it's what you create with what you know. Make the future catch up to you. We do. The new school in New York City. Good morning. I'm going to need a little bit more energy from this crowd today. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Courtney Millenius, and I'm the director of graduate admission for the Parsons School of Design. And I'm joined by some interpreters who are assisting us today. Today you'll hear about our school and our graduate programs as well as how to navigate the admissions process. But our history offers some important context for understanding how we became the institution we are today. The new school was founded nearly a century ago by academic visionaries from top universities frustrated by the intellectual timidity of academia at the time. They envisioned a new kind of institution where faculty and students would be free to openly address the problems facing the societies of the 20th century. Today, we have come to house five renowned colleges and schools here in New York City, four of which offer graduate degree programs. There's the Parsons School of Design, of course, which you're here to learn more about. The College of Performing Arts, which offers master's degrees through the Manus School of Music and the School of Drama. The New School for Social Research, which offers master's and PhD programs in the humanities and social sciences. The School of Public Engagement, which includes graduate degree programs in areas like creative writing, media studies, media management, nonprofit management, international affairs, public and urban policy, just to name a few. The Eugene Lang College of Liberal Arts is our undergraduate liberal arts college, and we also offer two of our master's degree programs at our campus in Paris, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Today, we are a comprehensive university of 10,000 students coming to us from 116 different countries and all 50 US states. The new school enrolls more than a third of its diverse student population from countries around the world. Domestically, we draw students from all 50 states. And this past year, the incoming graduate degree class for Parsons was more than 50% international, something we're very proud of. Each year, all of the colleges bring together students from across the country and around the world. Artists, designers, writers, performers, and creative intellectual thinkers, and prepares them to take on a world that in many ways doesn't exist yet. A progressive liberal arts college, a design school, and a performing arts college come together with legendary graduate programs and walls between disciplines dissolve. At our school, journalists collaborate with designers, architects with social researchers, media specialists with activists, poets with musicians. Parsons itself first opened in 1896 as the Chase School by leading a group of progressives to secede from the Art Students League of New York in search of more individualistic expression. Under the eventual leadership of Frank Parsons, the school then created groundbreaking programs linking art and design with industry. In 1970, Parsons joined the New School, where today we continue our legacy of, legacy of innovation in design practice, theory, and collaboration and Parsons is consistently ranked among the top art and design schools globally. To share more about Parsons School of Design, I am now thrilled to introduce Parsons Dean, Joel Towers. Thank you, Courtney. Good morning, everybody. It's cold out there today, right? It's kind of nice in here. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you all today, and um, we will be going through a bunch of slides here, but mostly I wanted to try to tell you a little bit of a story about uh, Parsons, its relationship to the New School, 
and what I hope will be valuable information for you in thinking about whether or not this is the right place to do graduate study. Um, the new school, as Courtney mentioned, uh, is part, uh, sorry, Parsons is part of the new school. Parsons is, in fact, the largest part of the new school with about 5,500 students taking courses along, across a range of undergraduate and graduate degree programs. And in fact, it's that scale and diversity um, of our 35 programs at Parsons uh, and um, the range of different offerings that we have that make us quite, I think, um, unique is probably the right word. But to do that, to be really unique is to be inside of a comprehensive university environment. There's really no other art and design school um, like Parsons that sits within a university structure in terms of our comprehensive size, the programs that we offer, and our relationship to the university. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how that uh, matters to us. And it really connects to the issue of design today. So why Parsons? Why design? Um, and I think it's both obvious to many of you here, and when I say design, I think it's important for you to hear uh, probably four words. Um, we talk about design and we mean art, we mean design, we, need, we mean business, and we mean strategy. All four of them uh, areas, both in terms of their practice and their historical um, and theoretical shape, are studied here at Parsons in our graduate programs. Um, and so the word design in a lot of ways is shorthand. Uh, for us when we, say, um, when we say it. But design in this sense, in that broadest sense of strategy and business and art and practice is really about the action of human imagination. It is, if you think about that phrase, design is the action of human imagination, it puts human imagination on one side of action and design on the other. And human imagination is not a neutral thing, right? So there are plenty of really um, bizarre and terrifying human imaginations. Think of building nuclear weapons as a, one of them, and design as a way of bringing that into being. And so it's not that human imagination is neutral or always good, but it is, and design acts on it. And in, in acting on it, it re recreates or produces human imagination. And so the idea that we are at an institution in which the question of human history and human imagination is so much at the core of our studies in the humanities and policy and planning, and that we bring that together with design allows for a very complex set of, and I think really rewarding set of ideas that can work across this notion of action. But in the end, we are about making change. We are about transforming the world around us. Um, and so that's why design matters. And it matters now more than ever, in my opinion. Because human imagination has transformed the world around us to the point at which human action has brought us to really significant points of planetary peril. We live in what is often referred to increasingly as the Anthropocene, the point in time in history where human action is the dominant force transforming the planet around us and by us. And if we live in the Anthropocene and we live in an age in which human action is the principal force making change, then we have to think about that as an age of design an age in which that human imagination and our re reaction to it and vice versa means that we can, if we live in a designed world, design it differently. And so from my perspective, design is really critical and it's really critical now. And the reason to do it here at the New School and at Parsons is because of that vibrant mix, because of the possibility you have as students to engage in partnership and collaboration and contested ideas around the very core questions of society today. So how do we do that? The curriculum at Parsons um, is uh, something that we are all incredibly proud of, and I'll talk a little bit about the faculty in a moment. But curriculum is not just a set of courses. A curriculum is a map of your experience across the arc of your time here, whether you're in a one-year degree with us in the graduate or a three-year degree, three-year um, uh, graduate degree, or in some cases, students staying even longer doing dual degrees. Um, no matter how much time you spend with us, we have tried to map that experience, that arc of that experience, through the design of our curriculum. 
and that curriculum is responsive to these core questions that I was just mentioning to you today. So it's not just environment and climate, it's questions of um, economic segmentation, it's questions of urbanization, it's uh, questions of technology, um, it's questions of migration. These are the things that are driving the dynamics of our world today. And the curriculum that we've designed is intended to explore those spaces. The programs that we build around those curricula um, are organized into what we call schools at Parsons. There are five schools within Parsons. And the idea of arranging our programs and the list that you see here of the programs, um, to arrange them into allied or affiliated programs where there is a sense of overlapping um, interest, uh, research questions, uh, in some cases facilities and other sorts of resources, but to do so in a way that allows for a cross cultural cross-disciplinary dynamic to occur. And then we bring those five schools together, each under the leadership of, uh, of a dean, to collectively produce Parsons. And so my job as dean of Parsons is to work with five really brilliant uh, academic leaders, uh, a couple of them who are here today, Robert Kirkbride and Sarah Lawrence, two of our school deans. Um, and you'll be meeting with many of the uh, program directors this afternoon. Um, or this afternoon, it's, it's still morning, right? <laughs> um, to work with the five school deans in order to build the relationships among the schools. And so you have school dynamics, you have the entire Parsons relationship, you have Parsons within the university, and these nested circles of engagement are what makes this place, I think, so unique. The other, of course, is New York City. How many of you are from New York City here or live in New York City currently? Or maybe I should ask it the other way. How many don't? All right, well, we have some visitors. Welcome. Um, New York is a laboratory for us. It's what makes studying here ex um, additionally compelling. So if you have a school and you have five schools as Parsons and you have a university, you also have a university within a city. And this city drives a great deal of the energy and the questions and the dynamics of what we study here at Parsons. Um, and we connect uh, through partnerships, uh, both with industry and cultural institutions. Um, one of our core programs, uh, the History of Design and Curatorial Studies, happens with and at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. So um, we're very connected, and we also use the city as a kind of laboratory of opportunities. So um, what you see being assembled in the top left is actually being disassembled right now. Uh, as I walked in this morning, the um, current street seats, which is this, uh, that's actually two years ago's version of the street seats that's animating right now, but it's, um, it's working with the Department of Transportation to take over series of parking spaces in New York City and turn them into an actual park. Um, and as I walked in this morning, they were disassembling this, this uh, year's version. I thought, well, that's good timing. Anyway, um, but uh, the, the city itself is really critical to, um, to what makes um, Parsons go, but it's not just this city. It's a global city, and we understand the dynamics of living in a global city as an opportunity to also think outward, both um, within the confines of the United States and internationally. And so we support, um, in a competitive way, funding for students, graduate students, for travel um, to conferences and other kinds of research um, focus as part of your study here at Parsons. Uh, and so we think of Parsons as part of a global network of cities, um, all focused on these core questions of culture and change uh, and urbanization. Now, it may not be a surprise to those of you who are planning to be in studio-based programs that we do project-based learning, right? That seems logical. But if you're coming in here to study in one of our uh, business degrees or our strategy degrees, um, or even in some of our history and theory degrees, the idea that we are project-based as a curriculum may, um, at first uh, blush, seem kind of unusual. But what's interesting about project-based learning is that it puts that word action back into the process of learning. It says that 
the reason that we are studying is in order to bring our knowledge into action in relationship to human imagination. And when you take that knowledge and that project-based learning and you bring it through business and strategy and history programs back into the studios, it enriches those project-based experiences in traditional studio programs. So our studio programs are further enriched by the dynamic of bringing together what we do at Parsons and what we do at the New School. To have anthropologists and sociologists and um, students who are getting degrees in music and policy in project-based learning interaction with you in your studios, um, I think makes for a very rich and dynamic uh, experience. The ones that we have here um, on the right uh, is work that we're doing right now with uh, Cornell Technion and their new campus. We've built a partnership with them where students are able to take courses at the Cornell Tech and vice versa, and we do a team um, structure. That's Tom Dixon on the bottom left in a project that we were doing with IKEA, and then more recently, um, actually it's been about four or five years we've been working on this project. The top image is from the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra where the musical director of that um, orchestra, Marin Alsop, who is still the only female musical director of a major symphony orchestra in the United States, which is kind of stunning, um, came to us and said, I want to work with you at Parsons to think about how to bring design and technology into the orchestral space. And so we've been redesigning many things about performance and movement, and inclusive of that, has been working with 3D body scanning and new techniques and materiality to build and design new clothing for the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra that actually responds to movement and um, performance, which will be launched this coming spring on the entire orchestra. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about um, is, as I mentioned earlier, how it is that we respond to complex problems. So these images are actually from um, our Healthy Materials Lab and the, and the Dongia Library that supports that. Um, we are very committed to work that connects into not just the human imagination, but the physical and um, sustainability issues that, uh, uh, resolve, or that revolve around that. So for example, uh, our Healthy Materials Lab is a multi-year research project, a $7 million funded research project that looks at the relationship between human health, building materials, and affordable housing. <clears throat> and it draws um, many, many of our faculty and students together around this question, this research question, and we bring that information back into our materials research labs. And so the research opportunities here are many. This is just a list of some of the partners and research labs that we've established. Um, as a graduate student, you would have the opportunity to be working with faculty in research labs, helping to frame research questions over multiple years. Um, and, uh, and again, that would augment your learning, but it does so in this very embedded, real-world, project-based way. Um, it's also the case uh, that the faculty themselves, as I mentioned earlier, really drive everything about where we are. So if you think about this, there are really three key components um, to making a school supportive of, ultimately, the students, you. And that is who the faculty are, what the curriculum looks like, um, and how you facilitate or resource it uh, in terms of the buildings um, and support systems. And one of the things that I can tell you, having been here now for 14 years, um, is that the faculty that we are able to draw into Parsons to attract to working at this school with all of you um, are the most extraordinary group of individuals dedicated to teaching and to research in a way that I am extremely proud to be um, the head of that faculty uh, and, and to see them, all of us, collectively reshaping this institution pretty consistently over the course of time. And so Parsons has this very long history that Courtney referenced, um, will be 122 years old at the end of this year. Um, and over the course of that time, Parsons has remade itself um, in many different iterations in relationship to the time and the challenges of a particular moment. 
And so if that moment today is, as I've said, as I believe it is, that we live in the Anthropocene, then rethinking the school in relationship to the challenges around us is what our faculty does. And they do that quite brilliantly. Um, their work, in many cases, uh, their creative practice takes physical form, but it also uh, takes scholarly form. And we see research, scholarship, and creative practice as part of an entirely um, integrated um, uh, choreography. Uh, this last year alone, um, there were uh, over 80 publications and 25 sole, sole authored volumes out of Parsons. Um, and that's a pretty typical year for us with uh, MacArthur Fellows and uh, um, uh, National Design Award recipients and Pulitzer Prize winners among our faculty. So if you've got faculty and you have curriculum, the next question or the third question really is the facilities. You're sitting here in the university center, this building um, which uh, had you been, or for those of you who are from New York or used to go down this street uh, over the years, used to be an old um, retail space, a department store, a four-story, <coughs> rather nasty building with very narrow slit windows and internal escalators that worked very rarely. Um, when the university tore that down and built this structure, it was the first time that we built a center to the whole campus. The new school has always been a collection of buildings um, along the street, uh, but this building is conceived of as a vertical campus. It's conceived of as a gathering space for the entire university. It houses one of four libraries that we have here um, on the university campus, the largest uh, on the top two floors of the academic space. There's also a dormitory facility above this building. Uh, it also um, houses many lecture halls, this being the largest. Uh, this space itself is transformable to, in this, this version to um, be able to host our orchestra or dance performances, but there are additional seating. These, all of these little things that I'm standing on go up and down. Um, and, uh, and the back opens up, so this is an 800-seat auditorium when it's fully um, opened, as well as multiple auditoria on lower levels. And this core led to um, a series of changes both here in terms of the culture and space available to students but across the rest of the Parsons facilities as well and at this, uh, after this event you'll have a chance to take a tour of some of those uh, other spaces including our making centers, our exhibition spaces. We have about 4,000 square feet of exhibition space on 5th Avenue and 13th Street. Um, The studios and shops, um, I like this slide because it's the messy and the obsessively neat. I like both of those things. Um, so when you're here as students, you should be really kicking the tires and transforming the place. It shouldn't always be neat, but um, on the far left are some of our studios. On the far right is one of the most extraordinary um, uh, photography resource, resource um, facilities in New York City. Uh, and then, of course, there's our Making Center. And the Making Center is about uh, 80,000 square feet of space across uh, the multiple buildings of Parsons. But recently, um, we constructed a new 30,000 square feet of it, um, really as the heart of what happens um, uh, around making. And the idea here really grew out of the changes in our curriculum, as I mentioned earlier. Right? So we had designed curricula that are responsive to the time in which we live. Um, a lot of that has to do with the social structuring and the policy issues and the dynamics of art and design practice and strategy and business. But ultimately, that action requires that we make, that we transform. And so the first thing we did as our curriculum was completed was to invest in building a new making center that brings together some of the oldest technologies with some of the newest technologies. We have printmaking and ceramics, but we also have 3D knitting and 3D printing. And these hybridized practices and hybridized materiality are part of what transforms the world today. Um, we just opened, just this uh, semester opened a 16 camera mo uh, motion capture studio in, the, in what was formerly a boiler facility in the lower level. It's absolutely fantastic. I hope it's open when you walk along there today. So, um, so that's a little bit of an overview of where we are at Parsons. 
What I would say to you in conclusion, at least for my portion of this, is that if you are interested in the big and animating questions of the world today, how you play a role in shaping them, transforming them, understanding them, communicating them, then this is a place that is completely committed to organizing itself around those very questions. And it does so by bringing together artists, designers, business leaders, strategists with students who are studying and faculty who are researching in the humanities, in policy, in the social sciences, in performance. And so it's quite a rich and dynamic environment. Um, I hope that you will think about coming and joining us and that you have a chance to ask lots of questions, both of our panelists and of um, our uh, program directors in the breakout sessions that follow. And thank you for getting up on a cold and um, finally cold fall morning. So uh, as Joel mentioned, obviously, you'll be utilizing the resources of both Parsons and the New School in so many ways. And no matter what area of study students pursue or which campus location, Parsons students will be challenged to understand the human needs that should inform their work. We ask our students to relentlessly question convention, take risks, and collaborate, unlocking their innate potential and the courage to innovate to create the type of future they want to live in. Today's graduate open house will focus on our New York City campus offerings. However, I'd like to take a moment to share with you some information about Parsons Paris, our degree granting campus in Europe. Located in one of the most vibrant creative economies in the world, Parsons Paris offers extraordinary educational, cultural, and professional opportunities for the growing number of students who seek a range of experience in art, design, history, theory, and culture. Established in 1921, Parsons Paris is the oldest American undergraduate degree program offered in Europe, inviting students interested in college in Paris to join our modern atelier. On the graduate level, we offer two master's degree programs in Paris, which include our MA Fashion Studies program, as well as our MA History of Design and Curatorial Studies program. Use the city as a laboratory, collaborating on creative projects and exploring ways to apply art and design to the challenges of urban life. Students in Paris either pursue their two-year degree uh, or come for a semester to study abroad. While study in Paris is certainly appealing for some, being a student in New York City is truly a unique experience. In addition to all the new school has to offer, our campus in the heart of downtown Manhattan provides a living and networking experience like no other. Graduate students who are interested in living in on-campus housing can apply for housing after they receive their admissions letter. And today we'll have a representative from the Office of Housing and Student Life available in the resource fair if you'd like to learn more. We also welcome you to have a meal in our dining hall to explore the many tastes of New York City. Or with just steps to legendary Union Square Farmer's Market, cafes, restaurants, and pizzerias await you as well. Our historic Greenwich Village campus makes for a truly unparalleled, adventurous home. In addition to the classroom experience, you'll also hear from today's leaders charting their own path towards becoming Nobel laureates, Oscar winners, authors, designers, and fashion magnets through the New School's public programs. This is an amazing resource, not only to our community, but to New York City residents as well. Our students are immersed in, being, in the work being done here every day. Last year alone, the New School students interned at more than 1,200 unique companies throughout the city, including places like Marc Jacobs, HBO, MTV, The New York Times, Marvel Comics, and the Museum of Modern Art. The New School also provides access to a lifelong network of talented and innovative minds. Faculty, alumni, advisors, and fellow students are actively engaged in their respective fields and can help link you to opportunities throughout the city and beyond. A representative from the Office of Student Advising and Career Services will also be available during the resource fair this afternoon if you'd like to learn more. Now that you're all excited to apply, I'm sure, I look forward to walking you through the application and financial aid process later this afternoon. I will be hosting two back-to-back -back admissions and financial aid workshops at 1.15 and again at 2.15 for you to learn more about the admissions process. I invite everyone to join these sessions after your program uh, breakout session has concluded. 
I'm thrilled to have told you more about the New School's programs and community today. From our inception, we've been an innovative, experimental institution focused on designing solutions for a better world, where you'll find energy that inspires passion and camaraderie with both like-minded and diverse communities. Now, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to some of our current Parsons Graduate Degree students who will share with you their experiences thus far. Please join me in welcoming Asher Sayre, a uh, current student in our uh, data visualization program, Javiera Arenas, <laughs> a student in our transdisciplinary design program, Nick Stagliano, yeah, I like these little rounds of applause. <laughs> Nick Stagliano, a student in our history of design and curatorial studies program, Paul Villanueva, a, a student in our design and technology program, and Tanner Chi, a, double a student double majoring, I should say, in interior and lighting design. Welcome, guys. Yeah. So I think it would be great, hopefully everyone's got their microphones, yeah? I think it would be great to start by having you introduce yourselves, tell everyone a little bit about yourselves, where you're originally from, uh, the programs you're in if you're a first or second year student, and um, what drew you to come to Parsons? Why don't you start, Osher? Yeah, uh, so my name is Osher. Um, I grew up in LA, and I went to undergrad at Berkeley. Um, I studied cognitive science and philosophy. And after that, I, I moved to Israel and I lived there for a few years. I worked at a startup. Um, and after a few years there, I just kind of, I missed school. I missed kind of engaging with interesting ideas and concepts. And I started um, inquiring into different grad programs. Um, and at the time, I actually applied to both PhD programs and master's programs. I applied here for the data visualization program. Um, I also, at the time, I applied to other PhD programs in information science. And I was kind of going back and forth between what I wanted, I wasn't really sure. Um, and ultimately, I chose this program because I, the way I saw it, this program kind of opened horizons where I saw that other programs would kind of really narrow my focus. And I really kind of wanted something to open, open me to new ideas and new domains and new fields. Um, specifically, this program is really uh, pretty amazing that I even see more now that I'm here because everyone in the program kind of comes from a different domain and direction. Um, so that's kind of what I what brought me here and what kind of made me made this decision was just to kind of get exposure to a new world in a program that kind of leaves me flexible to experiment in different domains. Try again. Try again. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm Javi. I'm from the transdisciplinary design program. Uh, it's my second year here. And I come from a graphic design and communication background. And before coming here, I was working as a graphic designer. And I guess what you understand from graphic designer as a traditional kind of approach in the sense of where I was working at least, um, my role was more beautifying things. And I truly believe that this design uh, has, of course, a component, a dimension of, of that because communication well-designed um, helps you better understand and, and better facilitate and better uh, further uh, work on your projects. Um, but I felt at that moment that I really wanted and strongly wanted to be part also about what happened behind the scene before you, you reached to that point. And uh, so I, I started feeling very stuck and, and I've always had, a, a, I guess, a desire, a dream of, of studying abroad because I, I'm from Chile, from South America. And I, I guess at that moment I, I started, or well, my husband pushed me because he saw my frustration in, in looking at design programs and I think I read them all. <laughs> and I, I guess I was finding, trying to find something that had a, a, a strategy approach, and, but also a, a social impact approach uh, focus. And so I, I started reading and looking online and, and then I, I found TransD, which 
uh, fit everything that I, I guess I was looking for. And, and yeah, I guess that's, that's how I, I found this school and, and it's been great. I'm Nick Stagliano, a first year student in the History of Design and Curatorial Studies program, also formerly known as the History of Decorative Arts, which gives you a, more of an idea of what we, what we focus on. Uh, I moved to New York after graduating from Hamilton College, where I studied anthropology and archaeology, and I worked for five years doing nonprofit fundraising, uh, which I progressively hated more and more every year and then decided that the best escape was uh, graduate school. And I drew on, yes, sorry. I drew on a love of ceramics and discovered the two programs in decorative arts history in the United States, both of which were here in New York, and one of which did not require the GRE. And so I applied to Parsons and here I am. Uh, and it's been an incredible learning experience, not just the things that I knew I'd be learning about, but um, I can now walk down the street and tell you different elements of architecture and uh, things about the New York City subway. So it really, even though I'm studying history and design history, uh, it has very current implications. Um, and it's endlessly fascinating. Hi, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm Paolo, or Paul, and before I came to Parsons, my undergraduate was computer science, but don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean I'm a very techie person. I'm actually more of a performer, an artist, and a designer, and I moved into the space of computer science because way back in 1998 to 2000, when the internet boom came out, I started seeing that technology was starting to seep in into almost every type of discipline that was going on. So I started moving to computer science because I wanted to be able to put in the things I loved, which was design, and stand in between technology and liberal arts to be able to sort of like mix in the design thinking, the things that I loved, and at the same time, technology that was going on. So before this, I attempted four startups that pretty much focused on interdisciplinary collaboration, social justice, human rights, and the common good. So I grew up in Los Angeles and the Philippines, and some of the companies I did there worked on a lot of projects with the European Union that both mixed technology and design together. So we were creating architectural spaces, we were doing interactive spaces, and of course, softwares and programs. And what drew me to Parsons was mainly because by attempting this with four startups, two of them failed and two of them pretty much like were rocketed, I wanted to learn more about the design thinking process and be in a space where there would be a sort of interdisciplinary collaboration with historians, biologists, designers, and a lot of people coming from all sorts of places around the world. And I started looking for universities that had this sort of collaboration that also had these ideas, of course, uh, social justice and everything and designing for the common good. And it was so, and it just narrowed itself down to Parsons because it somehow just made sense. And when I came in, I met a lot of people that was like, where were you from? Oh, I'm a biologist. It's like, okay. It's like, I'm a physicist, okay. And then it's like, um, I like, um, I'm an illustrator, it's like, but we're all coming in the same space together. And that made me learn a lot of things and it informed me of better ways to communicate, collaborate, to design something that would, I don't know, help the world and change it for the better. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tanner and I am in the double major, uh, interior and lighting design. Um, I'm actually in my third year because the double major is a three-year program, so last year to go. Um, I'm from Hawaii, and I came to grad school straight from my undergrad, and I did that in landscape architecture, and I did that in Las Vegas. So from Hawaii to Las Vegas to New York, I'm moving further away from home. Sorry, Mom. Um, and I, I chose Parsons um, because of the location. 
um, New York City. You know, kind of when you're looking for a par an apartment or you're looking for a home, location is a very important factor. And I wanted to be in one of the most inspiring cities for design. Um, so that's why I'm here. And, you know, just like Joel Towers said, um, New York City is a laboratory and it's also a network um, of you make so many connections and there's so many different opportunities in New York City for you to grow as a designer. So if you guys could tell us each um, a current class or project that you're involved in that you find most exciting and sort of what that uh, project is right now. Um, so I'm, a lot of the data visualization program, um, you can do it one year full time or you can do it multiple years part time. I'm in the full year program. So a lot of it is very project based. Um, and in our major studio class, we actually have a partnership with the UNDP to help them. They're working on a project to model and visualize inequality in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, this actually gave us a really amazing opportunity. We went to the uh, UN General Assembly and we're working with them um, to help make something that might remain invisible, otherwise kind of visible to a more broader audience. Um, so it's really a pretty amazing experience because it's also, it feels very, very important. And it also, even within that, we kind of have our space to explore ourselves as kind of designers and artists within that. So um, it's really, really exciting. In my case, um, the cool thing about transdisciplinary design is that it is a program that allows the students to or come with a hunch of a social, are social area they want to explore or maybe just come very open and, and dive in in the several projects that come throughout the courses. Um, and in my personal case, um, I, I came with an interest of, of trying to see and, and trying to learn how can I build a design practice around a healthcare area, health, healthcare services and, and patient experience. So um, I, I was lucky enough that uh, my first semester, uh, the, the program was offering the major studio, which is the most important uh, course at, uh, each semester, that was uh, called uh, Studio or Designing for End of Life. Uh, which had a healthcare approach. And uh, it was very fascinating for me because, well, first it was an area I wanted to explore, so I dived in right away. And also, I guess I, I faced, like, or embodied the experience of, of facing a, a, a very specific uh, topic, which is dying, um, that, that I realized that it's not usual to think about and far, even far away to design for. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I really like the challenge of feeling uncomfortable and finding a comfortable space in that uncomfortable area and, and just um, exploring the, the design methodologies and tools and, and the experience of working with with my peers at that time because I, I was in a course that mixed second years with first years. Um, so I, I, I learned so much just uh, working with them and through this very interesting topic, um, which truly for me at least formed uh, me um, like very, very strongly. I mean, I feel that after that course, many things were were not only defined, but um, as a formation. Uh, I think it was very relevant of the following year that, that happened. So, yeah. I'm in a course called Hamilton's World, which is about America during the time of Alexander Hamilton, um, inspired in large part by our professor's affection for the musical. <laughs> uh, but we're alternating between reading the Federalist Papers, of which Alexander Hamilton wrote, I believe, 51 out of 55, something like that, um, and also studying objects, some of which are in the Cooper Hewitt Museum, which, as Joel mentioned, is affiliated with our program. Uh, I'm studying an armchair that George Washington sat in during his presidential inauguration. 
uh, and it's raising all sorts of interesting questions about design for the first Republican, with a small r, uh, president, in contrast to centuries of monarchical design for the kings of England, which, of course, America was trying desperately to escape and finally did. Um, and this armchair is in New York City, so I was able to go and look at it. And class involves discussions about research techniques, finding articles from 18th century newspapers about the furnishings of George Washington's home. Uh, and most recently, I was in touch with a curator at the White House uh, who had written a paper 15 years ago about the furnishings for George Washington's first home in New York City. Um, so I just called the White House switchboard and said, I'm a graduate student, I need to speak to this curator because she wrote a paper 10 years ago and, and I need a copy of it. And I got it back, so that was fun. <laughs> Um, I don't think I mentioned um, I'm in the design and technology program when I was introducing myself. Um, one of the projects I, I think I maybe will just share too was brain computing interface. So basically like it's this project where we read, it's sort of like a mind machine interface. We basically have a non-invasive way to read the way brain waves pretty much move. And the way we create brain computing interface is we map the brain to different types of interfaces. It could be screen or prosthetics. And this is a way of designing prosthetics or objects or design that are basically controlled by our brain waves. So I think that was really cool <laughs> because this is basically a design that a lot of um, designers and engineers are moving towards where we can be able to move prosthetics without the need for armature, but rather move them natively as if you'd be moving your arm through the phantom limb. So it was a lot of fun by designing these objects that could try and draw just by controlling them with your brain. And I thought that was really cool. I felt like Charles Xavier for a moment there. Um, but it was also great because we were able to read how people would clench jaws, react to certain scenarios, and would also allow us to design experiences um, for them based on their brain reactions. And that kind of dabbled on in a very Black Mirror-esque scary moment when we realized like, oh, we could read the brain waves for how people react to spaces. But at the same time, we were also designing ways to help people move around. And another thing which um, we're currently working on is we're working alongside Havas to re-engineer and create an experience for Governor's Island um, this coming spring. So it's sort of a project that works alongside with Havas, and we also did some work with um, Verizon. So it's it's a pretty, pretty um, fun, fun experience in several projects. Uh, for me, studio classes are my favorite. Um, for those of you who are familiar with studios and how the studio culture is, that's where all your blood, sweat, and tears go. Um, that's what keeps you in school till you know the wee hours. Well, some studios close at midnight, so they require you to get some sleep. So it's kind of nice um, on our part. Um, one studio that uh, is comes comes to mind is uh, my second semester um, of my first year um, in the interior design program. We went to London. Uh, during spring break to work with the Royal College of Art um, on various different projects throughout, throughout the city. Um, and it was about interventions of the urban interior. So it was just um, different uh, minimal interventions or you know, an intervention at any scale um, with a particular site in London. So we formed groups um, and we had various sites to kind of work on as like sort of a wayfinder throughout throughout the city, and that was really fun um, because you know we got to go to London and work with the Royal College of Art, which is another pristine university for design. Um, but again, you make these connections internationally, um, which, which will last a long time. Uh, someone that I worked with um, at the Royal College of Art, um, one of their friends was interested at working at the place that I interned over the summer, and so he told her that or she saw, I guess, through LinkedIn or something that I was working there, and then that we had a mutual friend, and then so she asked him, and then he asked me if I could kind of like give her some pointers on her website or portfolio, and so I did so, you know, it's establishing these connections which, which will last a lifetime. 
Now I'm, I'm sensitive to the time and the fact that we've gone over a little bit. So this last question will be a two-parter for each of you. Um, just very quickly, if you could go down the row and tell us if you've had any internships. I guess we'll start with Tanner because that was a perfect segue. <laughs> if you've had any internships, professional opportunities, and then also if you could give one piece of advice to this year's group of students who will be applying, what would that be? Okay, so you great. kick it off, Tanner. Um, so. I did do an internship in Las Vegas for landscape architecture, um, but over this past summer, I did an internship in lighting design with a company called Lobservatoire. Um, they're a very, very well-established lighting design company here in the city, um, and they do a bunch of international projects as well as a lot of projects here around New York City. So a lot of the buildings um, in New York City, um, the they, they they did the lighting for. Um, so. The, the lighting design program um, is great with connecting you with uh, professionals around New York City, um, especially because lighting design is like an upcoming field and you know they really want lighting designers and we are the only lighting design um, program in New York City. And so it's very, very like easy. I don't know, I don't know if I would say easy, but it's very, ca you're very capable of getting an internship in New York City because again, this is the best part. This is the best place for design. And I guess the one tip I would give you in, when you're kind of going through the application, um, working on your portfolio, those are really important. Um, for your portfolio, really really showcase yourself. We wanna see, or I would, I would think that they really wanna see who you are as a designer. They wanna see your personality, what your interests are, um, and kind of where your skills lie. So really, really showcase that. Um. So with the several internships and the projects I've worked on with design and technology, it's basically like almost everywhere. Um, I'm currently um, doing work alongside Girls Right Now, which is a nonprofit for educating and com helping young girls, middle school and high school to be able to use new media tools to communicate. And previously, I also did work alongside the, uh, when I was in Parsons Paris, the Art Decorative, and as well as the museums in Italy, which was the Bargello. So there was a lot of stuff that's going on. So we worked with um, Verizon. So with design and technology, it's always a nonstop uh, set of projects. So the internships are really a lot. And I was very fortunate to have gone through a lot of those companies and experiences as well as Google, Verizon, and uh, of course, uh, local small companies as well that were partnered through the new school. So, my advice, I guess, goes into the idea of this process that we go through in technology and design, which um, a futurist from one of the former faculty here, Alvin Toffler, has, has this quote that sort of stuck to me, which was the process of learning, unlearning, and relearning, and trying to find a sort of program or course or major that allows you to go through this process, the design process of learning, unlearning, and relearning, trying to find that that you're passionate about, to find that course that you're able to do this process over and over again, would be, I think, the one that you should probably um, stick to because um, oftentimes when you work on something with design or a project and going through that process, it can get very tiring for most people, but it's not if you love it very, very much. So. I've only been in this program for about three months, so I've not had any internships yet, but it seems that with the connections of alumni from this program and Parsons generally, uh, it will be very possible, so I'm looking forward to that. Somewhat relatedly, um, with our affiliation with Cooper Hewitt and being five blocks away from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, we're often in the museums for class, having lectures with curators in front of extraordinary works of art, um, which is a really unique opportunity because of Parsons and because of being in New York City. Uh, as for advice, um, it took me five years to figure out what I really wanted to do with myself. Um, and now, having taken that time to find where I want to be and what I hope to be able to do for the rest of my life, um, not to dissuade anyone from applying now, but. Uh, I would encourage you to take the time to figure out what you want to do and what you really love because that will make quitting your job and losing your salary and 
doing a lot of reading and writing. Uh, if you love it, it will be all that much more worthwhile. Um, this last summer, I, I was lucky to do an internship in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, MSK. Um, I worked for the Design Innovation Group over there, and it was a great experience and, and actually, well, very insightful and, and very research focused, which was really great because it had a, a, a component of ideation and design concepts, but very towards the end. So it was like two, a little over two months, very focused on, on the research component to have then a uh, strong design for for a next stage, and and besides that, um, now currently I'm I'm doing a research assistant here at Parsons, and, um, and which has been a very interesting experience because we're working on designing a collaborative mod model between uh, Parsons and organizations that um, can partner up with some courses, and and for now specifically we are working with Planned Parenthood, and. And it's also been um, a really great experience. And I guess uh, a tip or advice, um, considering that you guys are applying, for me at least, um, and I still remember it, um, doing the exercise of the, the personal statement, I, I think it's called, the, the essay that have, you have to write about your inspiration or why you want to do this, um, for me was um, very cl clarifying, uh, and to your point, like uh, to understand like what you want to do. Uh, so just doing that exercise, but tr doing like very truly, and trying to um, put in that paper like your inspiration and, and what drives you. Uh, I think not only for the application, but but then as your starting point when you you start your graduate program, I think it's it's very useful. And and then when when you're actually studying, just always like have a follow up with yourself like um, and a check in if if you're doing what inspires you because I think that's the key for everything. Um, I would echo a lot of what everyone said here. Um, I am also in my third month out of a one year program so there's just kind of no time right now for an internship. But that said we are getting a lot of emails from the head of our program about different opportunities so I'm sure once time is allows it, there will be a lot of options. Um, as for tips, I would say something that I've learned a lot just in the two, three months of being here so far was just the ability to kind of open your eyes to the world around you and kind of like let yourself be inspired by things um, to kind of this receptivity or just being open to new domains and new subject matter I think is um, something really helpful for these processes of kind of figuring out where you want to go um, in the next step. And also to kind of take chances and not be afraid of failing is something that I think, I don't know if you feel it's like really kind of encouraged here. And, um, and I think also kind of in the application process to not stop yourself, like go for it and don't be afraid of kind of giving yourself a chance to explore and become inspired. Well said. Well, thanks, everyone, for being here.